that first topic that I mentioned this morning, and that is systems thinking and systems leadership. And we're so fortunate to have, in just a few minutes on that screen, Peter Senge joining us from Boston, so keep an eye on that screen. And I've been with Peter, fortunate enough to be working with Peter, um, a bit over the last few years, and I once heard him say that he is on an odyssey to find places in the world where the future we desire is starting to show up. And he sees British Columbia as one of those places. So, if all goes well, please welcome Peter Senge. Hey, Peter. Hello, Maria. How are you doing? I'm fine. We just had a chat about it being cold there, but I guess everybody here knows that it's cold there. Well, it was colder. It's actually much It was very cold last So, Peter, you're, I know you're looking into the face of uh, Tasha right now, who's in the back of the room. She's our technician. But in fact, what you're looking at is you're looking out to a room of just under 500 educators and community partners who are all here because they care about the, the well-being and the mental well-being, emotional, social well-being of children and youth. And um, you are going to set the stage for us around um, how systems thinking, systems thinking leadership can build on the work that's being done in British Columbia and elsewhere. But maybe you could begin by just telling us what you mean by systems thinking leadership, systems thinking. And what it's got to do with people in this room? Sure. Um, so first off, one favor: um, if it's possible to mute your mic, because what I'm doing is I'm hearing my voice through the delay through your mic. If they can take it through that, and I would, won't, won't hear that. No, that's fine. so. Um, the word "system" is always a problematic word. Uh, because it doesn't connote much at all what we're really looking at in this field. The word system typically nowadays means computer system or, you know, not my fault, it's a stupid system. Uh, but when we're really thinking deeply, when we're really thinking deeply about most anything, we're practicing system thinking because we're starting to look below the surface events to the deeper sources of problems. And when we do that, we start a world that's much more interconnected, which is really all the term system is pointing to. It's just pointing to the fact that the realities we deal with are vastly more interconnected than we realize. We think we can do something over here in a classroom, but of course the kids aren't just in that classroom all the time. They're in a lot of places. And we think we can intervene in the classroom over here, but not in the larger school climate. And by the way, the kids, by and large, don't live in schools. So there's the school, the classroom, the school, climate, and culture. But then there's the larger community. So this is really a web of interconnectedness. So that's all that systems think is trying to remind us of. Uh, my, one of my fantasies is that if all this work really goes well in a, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, we'll just drop the systems part and call it thinking. Because I think it's exactly what we, what we really think. We go below the surface of this. Uh, so that's been the core and core of our work for a very, very long time. And when you start to see a world of that sort, this kind of interconnected, dynamic, emergent world, you realize that there's no simple answers. It's not about having a plan and sticking to it. It's not about fixing problems according to some rigid, predetermined formula for what's needed. So that's why learning and systems thinking always go together. You know, you can only adopt expansive and learn. Let's try something. Let's see what works. And let's kind of learn as we go. So that's how the whole learning organization and systems thinking just became a, a natural uh, marriage many, many years ago. Uh, and then a funny thing happened. This was probably a couple of years after the fifth discipline was initially published, which was a long time ago, um, I started getting uh, notes from educators. And they said strange things like, uh, should the school be a learning organization? And I thought, oh, well, it's kind of hard to argue with that. But of course, the culture of most schools is really not. 
teachers are often see themselves as experts, the quote sage on the stage kind of metaphor. They see their job as kind of fencing what they know, they've invested a lot of time, big part of their life in becoming experts. Uh, but it's not just that, in climbing school, um, real learning organizations are extraordinarily collaborative. Uh, organizations tend to be organized structurally, formally, you know, in rigid walls, silos, or chimneys, kind of a metaphor in life. Um, and people don't work a lot across those boundaries. So I'll never forget many years ago, I heard a teacher say, when I close that door, I'm God in my universe. I've never forgot that phrase. Uh, so there's often an image in a lot of professions, teaching is probably one, of kind of individual as professional, as opposed to team, and as opposed to larger network. So that's the other thing that kind of goes in the glove with all this. If we start to see the organization as a system, as a, a much more of a community than just isolated professions. And that all sounds really, really good, but it's not easy. And it does tend to contradict the prevailing cultures inherited in most schools, which again, particularly in the industrial age, became organized around technical expertise delivered by professionals, and then we test ourselves when we're all done, pretty much like a big assembly line. So assembly lines and communities are two very, very different types of systems. All right, my mic's back on. Peter, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So um, what are the, first of all, you used the word leader, or we did at least in the introduction. What do you consider a leader? Who's a leader? There's certainly a lot of leaders in this room, but in systems thinking, what's a leader? Well, we always try to make the distinction between a formal responsibility, or you might say your role of authority. When you're in a position of authority, a superintendent, a school principal, uh, whatever, that, that's a position of authority. And in colloquial use, most of us refer to those people who notice where my finger kind of automatically points. Um, so those are leaders up there. The rest of us, we're just here, whatever, doing whatever, we're the followers or whatever. Um, that doesn't really help too much for deep change processes. And I'm sure this is a very real issue for many of you. Because usually when people are really serious about trying to create environments where deep change can be sustained, they're very attuned to the fact that it's just not enough to have good leadership at the top. Leadership really has to come from everywhere. And I don't think romantic or idealistic, I think it's immensely practical. Interestingly, it's actually the root word of the verb, the English verb, comes from the Latin root, uh, life, which where it typically would be written. Very old word, uh, pre, I said Latin, uh, uh, pre, no, repeated, very old word, and it means to step across the prison. So I always think that's the real leaders are. They're the people stepping across the threshold. In any complex system, there better be a lot of them, or no real change will occur. Because the deeper change in values and practices and mental models and assumptions, they have to arise in different places. There is an important role for executive but it's not the only thing. So we often talk as leaders, as people who are good at fostering collaboration in order to bring about and these can be teachers, they can be parents, and of course, they are the student. One of the most important types of leaders to see deep change comes from the students. What are the, the qualities, do you think, of people you've seen who are you know, really awesome systems thinking leaders? What, what kinds of things do they do? How do they think? What's different? Well, uh, first off, it, what I was referring to, earlier, this kind of, or you might say, I'm a learner. Just repeat that. The first has to be ability, or the kind of stance of the learner. I don't have all the I may have a where we need to go. So the second thing I was saying is that it's this kind of capacity to create a space or environment where people start to come together. We often call it the skill of reflective conversation. In a very funny, very simple way, 
the core process whereby all organizations operate and all change processes unfold is the processes of conversation. How we talk to each other. Do we really listen to each other? Are we so busy trying to kind of get our point across that we really, you know, as one, I remember years ago, one student said, oh yeah, listening, that's when I'm waiting to talk. And that's of course true for all of us to some degree until we build a capacity to really give attention, to really give attention to the other. And as we start to do that, we start to create a different kind of social space or environment or setting where people feel really listened to. We all know what that's like. When I've really been listened to, I know. And conversely, when I know people aren't listening, I'm quite aware of that as well. So this capacity to kind of really create a space or a setting or a field, we often call it a more generative social field, that really is characterized by people listening and reflection. And, and lastly, you know, when all is said and done, you have to have vision. You know, so where are we going? What do I really care about? Um, it's almost tautological. It's almost a definition that everybody would agree that leaders are people who care deeply and there's something they're trying to create. They're not just trying to react to a bunch of problems. We've used this distinction for a long time to help people begin to understand. It's very, very easy, particularly when you're in a position of authority, to find your life consumed by reacting to the crisis of the moment. So this reactive firefighting or reactive problem solving is, is not bad. I mean, look at it. We have to react. You're in a position of authority and something needs attention. You give it attention. The problem is often that's all we're doing. We're reacting, 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 reacting. So this last kind of thing that characterizes systems leaders is, um, let's just say a different kind of balance between reacting to the problems as they arise and really moving towards where we want to go, the reacting and the creating not one or the other. You know, one of the things that we, that everyone here is interested in and from last year's conference asked for was more information about how to expand and grow and really uh, shift a culture around this, this idea of mental health and well-being being, being most important. So how is it that systems thinking is more likely to um, have that happen? I'm trying to figure out what's different about it that some kind of culture shift might happen as opposed to just a change of um, rules or change of policies? Right. Well, I think the, uh, the short answer to your question is that it's about transforming the quality of the relationships that are operating. I mean, systems work the way they work because of how we work. We often forget that. And again, this is where the word system is problematic. People think, oh, well, system change. That's a policy change. Or that's something, that, again, that only the people at the top can do. Uh, there's so many policy changes that are in name only. Nothing really changes. Systems work the way they work because of how we work, how we think, how we are with one another. So really deep systemic change is always changing or shifting the quality of relationships that are operating. And that's not an abstraction. That's in every meeting, every conversation. That's why I was emphasizing a few minutes ago this quality of listening. Um, now, all that, again, sounds pretty philosophical, maybe a little idealistic. Until you have tools and methods, until you have actual ways of going about it. I'm an engineer by training, and I think one of the inheritances you have when you're trained as an engineer is you really believe in tools. And I think you know, the way you've got this program planned is great because after we, you and I finish, Maria, you're going to have some folks who've been busy doing this for last year from one of the local school districts, Maple Ridge, if I recall. And, and I think their journey is very illustrative. You know, they came to a workshop a year ago, I think it was, and they also had other support structures there, people who could help them, but they just went off and started practicing with some of the tools. Um, there's an old saying, if you want to change how someone thinks, give up. You cannot change how another person thinks. Give them a tool, the use of which over time will lead them to start thinking differently. It's a very important learning. So we, we are big believers in tools and practices, and they've got to be simple enough to be usable by most anybody who's interested, which, by the way, in this case, has the nice additional benefit that whatever the adults are using to, develop, to, to support their own journey of systems thinking, the exact same tools can be used across the K-12 spectrum and are. 
What's an example of a systems tool that you use or you've used with people that you found, maybe especially in education, led to some aha moments and maybe some culture shift? Well, I think you're going to practice just a little bit with something called the systems thinking iceberg. Um, it's very simple. It took about 25 years to develop. <laughs> It's always the way, you know, to get something really simple and really workable takes a long, long time. But it kind of gets at the heart of the epistemology or the ways of seeing that define the system's perspective. And it basically comes down to learning how to distinguish the events on the surface, you know, the crisis in the moment, the fire that just broke out literally or figuratively, the, all those problems that I was referring to before that people in leadership positions often find themselves compelled to have to react to, to the deeper, longer-term patterns that are unfolding behind those events until still deeper what we call the systemic structures, the underlying habits of thought and action and artifacts that are really shaping how the system operates that generates the patterns and in turn eventually produces those events. I think you're going to practice that tool in just a little bit. You'll get a much better feeling by doing it. And, and what's the point of that? Is the idea that you somehow see, as you mentioned at the top of the iceberg, we all know there are problems, there are things that happen over and over again. With that and other tools, is the idea that you somehow see those problems differently? You see your system differently? You see yourself differently? What's the point? Well, the point in the simplest sense is real change. I mean, how many times have you noticed yourself reacting to a problem and then a week later, you've got the same kind of problem. It may be not literally the same in every single detail, but it's more or less the same. And then you've got another problem and another problem. We often refer to this as the problem solving treadmill that leaders, again, people in positions of authority often feel they're stuck on. The real difference is just reacting to the same old, same old, same old, same old versus creating a set of conditions which don't produce those problems yet. You know, the getting to the deeper sources of problems. I mean, it's not a it's not a radical idea. At some level, this is why I said, you know, I was joking before, sooner or later, maybe we'll just call this thinking. Real insight gets you to a deeper level where there's real leverage. This is really the, the operational or practical definition of, of real insight. It brings you to a way of seeing things that actually can produce a longer term change. You're not just kind of reacting to the moment. You're not just putting band-aids on. You have a system that's actually going to generate a different set of conditions. And you no know, band-aids aren't bad. You know, I had my hand stuck in a door last week. Guess what? The band-aids were very useful. But this system has the ability to heal itself. Therefore, the band-aid is going to be temporary. Imagine that your organization, culture, and climate has that capacity to heal itself that the band-aid serves the function of a band-aid. It doesn't become a lifelong occupation. You're right, we're going to be hearing from Maple Ridge Pitt Meadows next, and I think it is going to be helpful because there are some really practical applications of those tools. Um, because I think in a system, we systems do tend to want to go back to the center or back to the way they are. Is that the way systems work? Well, yeah, in biology you call it homeostasis, right? A living system can maintain balances. That's what one of the conditions for living. It's always able to kind of take something that moves to the side and bring you back to where you are. Social systems are no different. They're very homeostatic. We often call it, you know, the status quo, the power of the status quo. And you know, the truth is probably 80, 90% of that status quo is fine. It's not problematic. But there's another typically 10 or 20% it's very problematic. You know what, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that yeah, I suppose you, you would hope, or one would hope that you just apply these tools and miraculously change happens. But I, I know that in my family, we've been doing family systems for years and try to understand our family. And it does take years. And just when you think you've got the system fixed, the system changes. So just say something about that. Maybe patience is it, or what is it? Perseverance, what is it? Well, I think what you're really pointing to is fundamental limitations in the whole kind of problem-solving paradigm we often live in. I actually don't think at some fundamental level this is really about solving problems. Um, life is 
going to always generate new problems. I mean, there's no answer to how to raise our kids, right? There's no answer to how to be a, a, a good son or daughter of an aging parent. This is life. This is not about fixing things that are broken. The problem is oftentimes the problems are the deepest problems. We really feel impotent. We feel there's nothing we can do about them. So it's not about fixing the problems in the sense that they're over and done. It's are we really engaging in the things that matter most? So you're absolutely right. You don't fix a broken system. You allow yourself to get engaged in a way that it starts to improve. But of course, like anything in life, it'll improve for a while and then new problems will come. And then new problems will come. The question is, do we have a sense of efficacy that we actually can do something that improves matters? Again, it's not about fixing them once and for all. That's much more a machine kind of image. The machine is broken, we've got to fix it. But the truth is, these are problems that we live through. The question is, are we alive? Are we really engaged? Are we doing the things that really matter? And do people have a sense of, of deep confidence that we really can move? The things go up and down, but there's a trend, you might say. That's leadership. Leadership is not a phony, you know, fake facade of I've got all the answers. We see that a lot in the world today. And I think many of us feel down in our gut, it's almost the antithesis of leadership. I've got the answers, listen to me, do this. Um, that's a, a type of leadership that comes out of lack of confidence. The real confident leader says, you know, I don't have all the answers, but we need to move in this direction, we know that. And let's get going. And let's build some confidence that we can sustain that process of improvement. I think one of the wonderful things about the work you're doing in, you know, with all kinds of organizations is that it's not just about that individual leader doing this work. It's always about a team. And so it's not just one person who says we can get through this. The team not only becomes closer, but it seems to me they become more adept at seeing the problem and saying, oh, yes, and this too, as opposed to we're in trouble here, so-and-so is to blame. No, that's absolutely right. I actually think if you look over the long sweep of things in the in the business world, where of course we have most of our practical experience up until the last 10 years or so, uh, one of the big shifts that's occurred in the world of business over the last two, two or three decades has been almost everybody works in teams. Didn't used to be that way. Most people work for a boss. Now there's still bosses. It doesn't mean hierarchy has disappeared because hierarchy can play a real function. The problem is when all you had was the hierarchical structures, <laughs> I'll never forget years ago, a guy at Ford said, ah, I've always known who my customer is, it's my boss. If I please my boss, everything else is okay. So I think this evolution to more team structures and hierarchy and a different kind of balance has been a really big shift. I think we're still in the pretty early stages of that shift in education. Again, historically, it was an extremely individualized profession. But I think more and more, and I'm sure this is true of most of you in your schools, in your school districts, are really trying to foster a real sense of, no, it really is collaboration. Together, we have to work to shift the climate of the school. It's not enough to have one or two brilliant teachers, and then the kids have to suffer through all the rest. That's just not going to cut it. It's totally inadequate. So we have to learn how to work together so we all become more brilliant teachers. And collectively, we're really shaping a more coherent and generative social climate and culture. So this shift from individual professional, isolated professionals, I would say, to connected, collaborating professionals is a very deep shift. And it does usually take a, a, a generation or two. I think the education, a lot of the best school districts now are well along the path. They've definitely starting, but it requires different skills. That's kind of what we're talking about, this systems leadership. These are the skills of building more effective teams and networks of collaboration. We, um, we're just about uh, running out of time here, but and, and I want one more question for you, but just to say to everyone that you kindly pre-recorded um, some other short videos that will be shown throughout the next two days just to, to see what your perspective is on the, the other topics that we talked about, that I talked about this morning, that we're going to be talking about. So thank you in advance um, for that. But I wonder if you have any words of advice for everyone who's here today about how we can all show up for this two days um, as systems thinking learners, as system thinkers, um, what would you say to us about how to, how to try to do that? Do whatever Maria tells you to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No, I think it's a brilliant, I mean, Rhi and I walked through this program on a few occasions, and I think it's really well designed because you're going to move kind of from this general introduction to the indigenous perspective, which is by its nature, kind of, you don't need to talk about systems thinking to native peoples. I mean, they, their whole universe is about interconnectedness. Uh, to the, vo the, ro the, the role of students and the role of data and measurement. And in each cycle, uh, I think you'll encounter a little different angle on the system's perspective. And in each cycle, you'll hear some from practitioners like the Maple Ridge people coming up, and then you'll do a practice. So I just think follow the program. It's really, really well planned. And I was so excited when Maria first walked me through it a month or so ago. I think it's, it, it should be worked really, really well. Well, Peter, thank you, and here's a pause.